Most beginner traders, myself included when I was getting started, do not read candlestick charts correctly. We miss the obvious buy and sell signals that more experienced traders are seeing. And those more experienced traders are not only seeing the buy and sell signals, they're acting on them in real time in order to profit from stocks, futures, currencies, cryptocurrencies that are moving higher. In today's episode, I'm gonna share with you the top five mistakes that I am seeing beginner traders make. So now we are gonna jump in with number one. The first mistake is not understanding shadow theory. Now some of you are saying, Russ, what the hell is shadow theory? There we go. That's why you're watching this episode. So let's jump onto the whiteboard and let's imagine that this is a proper candlestick chart. Each one of these are actual candlesticks, not just lines. So we have a chart here where the price has moved higher, it's pulled back, popped up, pulled back, broke out of this resistance area, pulls back a little bit, pops higher, and then on this day, probably there's bad news and it drops all the way back down. Now, some traders naturally want to buy the dip down here for a bounce back up. That's fine. But as part of that process, we have to establish a risk versus reward. So when we're thinking about the reward, we're probably looking for what is nearby resistance. How much can this bounce up before it's going to hit resistance? And unfortunately, what some traders will do is they'll say, oh, well, it had resistance right here uh, in this area previously, right there. So I'm going to say that is my target for resistance. That's, that's going to be resistance. So that's my profit target. And this is an incorrect analysis of a candlestick chart because it is disregarding shadow theory. So what shadow theory tells us is that everything that occurs behind this candle, the price has already been broken. It had a chance when it was coming down here on this day when it was selling off on this day as it was dropping, it had a chance to find support and it didn't on this day. It kept going lower and lower and lower and lower. So now as it comes back up, this price has already been broken. Any buyers that were sitting at this price here waiting for the stock to come back down to prove that this previous resistance level would become support, well, they're gone. The, the price broke below that level. So because of shadow theory, now everything that happened prior to this candle to the left, all of this has become invalidated by this candle. So now if we're looking for nearby resistance or support, we're going to be having to look above the top of this candle or below the bottom of this candle. That is shadow theory. Now, let me show you an example of what that looks like on an actual stock chart. So here's a, uh, a stock that we've been looking at recently. It's put in a pretty big move. And if you were looking at this chart, naturally what I would do is I would pull it up and I would say, all right, this has been moving higher. How do I analyze potential areas of resistance? So what I want to do is I want to look to the left this way and I have to look up. So I generally start with some of the largest and most obvious areas, and I would mark out the high of this candle here. That's a huge candle, so I'm gonna mark that out. And then I'm gonna mark the high of this candle here. Okay, so now we have two levels. We have 1208 and 796. Is there any resistance on the daily chart between 796 and 1208? I would say no, because you cannot look at these areas right back here as being resistance. It broke through those prices on this day right here. So some traders will draw a line right here. They'll say, oh no, this is resistance. I'm gonna draw a line right here and I'm gonna draw another line right here and I'm gonna draw another line you know, here and here. And when they do that, they are breaking through a candle and they are basically disregarding this shadow theory, this theory that everything that happened behind this candle has been invalidated because the price broke it. So what I would say on this is that we have resistance at 796, we have resistance at 1208, and if we want to look for the next level of resistance, we've got to look to the left and up. So what's the top of this candle here? The, whoa, that goes way up there. So the top of this candle is our next level of resistance, $26. This is a chart that I would say has large windows. This is a window right here. It's not a gap. A gap is formed when the stock opens higher or lower, and there's just blank space on the chart. This is a window. A window is formed when you just have a really large candle. So it's a window or a pocket where there really isn't any resistance whatsoever if it gets up to that area. 
Now that was at 796. That was the first trigger, 1208, and then the high, all time high, in fact, on the stock is at 2660. But if we come back down a little bit further, uh, we might be able to find some other areas that could be resistance. So I would say, all right, we've got the high of, well, perhaps this candle here. That would be fine. The high of this candle because it hasn't been invalidated by any recent price action. But now let's go forward. Oh, wait a second. Okay. So see this green candle right here? This green candle, it broke through that high. That means this line can go away. That one is no longer valid. But we still have the resistance here at 796. And in the future, I would look at this chart and I would say, all right, well, technically, we also have resistance at the high of this candle here. So there is now a bit of uh, sort of two levels of overhead resistance right around $8. That's going to be an important level for this stock to break. But if it can break eight and it can hold over eight, then the next logical target is a move up to 1208. If you do not understand shadow theory, you're going to end up drawing a ton of unnecessary areas of potential resistance on your chart. And it's going to be inaccurate. So the traders who are going to do the best are the ones who are going to draw the correct support and resistance lines, both uh, horizontally as these ones are, but also in the form of ascending and descending. So this is OCEA, a great example of a stock that has, um, as you can see, clearly several uh, windows on the chart formed by uh, large candles. Now we could look at another, um, oh, let's see. We'll just look at another example here, another chart and see how this one looks. We'll pull this up. So this one sort of similarly had a huge day two days ago, this giant big green candle here. And on that day, before that candle started to pull away, I was looking as always to the left and up. So I was first looking to the left and I noticed this area around 268 right here. I look to the left, I look up and I notice that there's a little bit more resistance right around $3. Now, this is very common for stocks uh, and, and really all uh, candlestick charts to find resistance at half dollars and whole dollars. So resistance at three. And then above that, these little areas here, you know, you could say each of them could be small areas of resistance, but they're not significant because they don't mark a high that you would really look at in a big way like you might for this candle. It's just a gradual kind of descending down. But I would look at the top of that move. The top of that move is right here, which is just under $4, whole dollar of resistance. So I would say around four. And then we look again to the left and up. And we've got this one around 440. So around the half dollar, that makes sense. And then we look to the left and up. So 579. Now I'm skipping the high of this candle right here. I'm skipping that level because that level was broken on the very next day. So that, that candle is gone. It's no longer significant. Then I look again to the left and up, and I'm going to be looking at this candle here, which has a high of 950. All right. So now we start to look at this chart and we're like, okay, now we've got our areas of possible resistance. And this one at 950 is particularly interesting because it appears that it matches to a double top uh, right around there. Now this one didn't come quite to that level. It was darn close. This one broke over it, but you can see that the stock several times has come up to $9 and been unable to hold above it. So that is probably worth noting. All right. And this is this is not exactly in the shadow if it's a double top. A double top is an exception. Uh, then we look to the left and up. Nothing super significant here, but I would typically look at the top of a move and draw a line right there. So now we move forward. We jump forward onto our current chart and we start to look at this price action and what I'll sometimes do is I'll switch that time frame from the daily chart into you know the five minute chart like that open it back up and now that I've drawn all these trend lines now I have a sense of okay where might this find resistance and you can see we kind of struggled around nine dollars this is an area that the stock previously had shown some resistance so that was the right place to be drawing a trend line some of these areas a little bit lower um Let's see how they, oh, so that was, oh, sorry. Um, this was, this was the area here. So let's go back here. Right. Okay. So we came up to about 579, pretty much broke through these areas with no problem up to 579, back down, back up, back down. 
really didn't have too much resistance at $9. In this case, it pretty much did break right through it and went right up to this high, but that's interesting that it came up to just about 1730. By that point, it was into a daily resistance level and the trend was getting ex exhausted. Now at this point, because of shadow theory, all of the trend lines that are in this area can be removed. Now, it's also important to recognize, and we can go back to the OCEA chart, that some traders will confuse the difference between resistance um, that is created by a candlestick and resistance that might be created by something else. So let's look at this chart again for a moment. So some of you might be, might maybe a keen eye. Some of you notice, well, wait a second. Um, you know, this level here, we'll delete this one at 796, that seems to correspond, yes, obviously here, but it corresponds here and here. So that negates shadow theory, you dummy. All right, now hold on. Before you before you call me a dummy, what I will say is that in this moment, when the stock came up to this level, the reason I believe that it had resistance there was not because of these two candles right here, but instead because of this purple indicator the 200 exponential moving average. So if the first mistake is that traders do not understand shadow theory, the second mistake is that beginner traders don't look at the 200 moving average. The 200 moving average is one of the most respected moving averages on a daily chart. It is so key. So I am always looking at the 200 moving average. Now I like to use the 200 exponential moving average. However, something that I will tell you is that it's not a bad idea to also have the 200 simple moving average on your chart. So we're going to put on a moving average here. Let's see, we'll just call this moving average and I'll show you what it's going to look like. All right, so when you put on your moving averages, we're going to go full screen. My exponential, I've got my 200 EMA right down here. And then let's see, which, which one did I just add? Um, oh, it's the blue one right here. All right, so I'm going to double click this. I'm going to change this to, oops, a 200. So we're going to change that to a 200 EMA. And I'm going to change the line on this to be uh, orange, but I want to change it to be um, dotted like this. Sorry, purple. I said orange, I meant purple. So the 200 EMA and the 200 SMA are two very well-respected indicators. Now, there are a lot of traders that use the simple moving average instead of the exponential. So for that reason, I think it's okay to have both on the chart. But as you can see here, this chart clearly responds to the exponential moving average. It shows it very clearly there and there. When you look at something like uh, the S&P 500, You'll notice that the S&P 500 at various times has responded a bit more to the simple moving average. Here's the simple right up here. Uh, that's a good, that's a, a spot where you could see it kind of held down in this area, sort of was holding there. But I think that they're both valid. Because a lot of people use both of them, it's not a bad idea to have them both on your chart. But if you're looking at a chart like something uh, like OCEA, and you do not have the 200 exponential or simple moving average, you are flying blind. You wouldn't understand why this had resistance right here. When to me and other experienced traders, it is so clear. Obviously it's gonna run into resistance here. It's at the 200 moving average. Now, because of course I have a lot of beginner traders in our community at Warrior Trading, while I'm streaming every single day, traders will sometimes ask questions. They'll pull up a chart. They'll say, hey Ross, um, you know, what about HOLO? I like HOLO. It's starting to pop up a little bit here. And I look at the daily chart and the first thing I'll say is, guys, you know, it's below the 200 moving average. You can obviously see that. That means if it comes up, it's definitely gonna have resistance at the 200. Now in this case, maybe you could say there's enough room for it to move up to the 200 and it's not gonna have resistance. You know, you, you could take that trade. But in the case of a lot of stocks, if the 200 is really close by, it's not worth buying right into that level of resistance. There are just going to be too many people selling. So NKGN, this has resistance at the 200 at five. It's a little ways now away at 250, but on this day here, it was getting awfully close. So I don't want to buy right into this moving average. So anytime a trader 
in the chat room will say, hey, Ross, you know, take a look at XYZ. I'll pull it up. The first thing I'm looking at is the daily chart. And what I'm looking at, number one, is what's the position of the 200 moving average? Now, yes, you have days where a stock could have really great news and it could break through it. But more often than not, if it's below it, it's going to come in uh, and run into it. And this is actually a chart where you can see that um, this one was running into maybe the simple a little bit more. A uh, simple moving average may be more respected on this particular stock. So again, as I said, it's not a bad idea to have them both. I'm going to save my chart like that. Uh, usually I do have them both, but that one um, came off for some reason. Okay, so mistake number one, not understanding shadow theory. Mistake number two is not checking the position of the 200 exponential moving average before considering whether or not a trade is worth taking. Number three, I made my list here, not checking the float. And this is so simple for, for me. It's one of the one of the first things I check as well. And I can see it right here on my chart float. It's right there. I'll have traders and I can't say the number of times this happens. They'll, they'll say, Hey, Russ, check out this stock. Uh, you know, the chart looks interesting and I pull it up. I look at the chart and the float is, you know, it's, it's a ridiculous float. It's 150 million shares. It's 200 million shares. It's a billion shares. S O U N it's 188 million shares. So you've got to know what you're trading. Why is float so important? Well, let's jump back on to the whiteboard for this one. Float is our supply in the supply demand equation. So whenever I'm looking at a stock to trade, I want to see characteristics of demand. All right. So a demand characteristic, number one, the stock is up at least 10%. It's moving quickly. Number two, it has high relative volume. That's the average volume today relative to what's normal. Three, it typically has a news catalyst. Number four, the price is between two and 20. These stocks have more demand than stocks of higher price because they're more affordable by retail traders. Now, the supply side of this e equation, the only thing here is the float, the number of shares available to trade. So when a stock has a float, when a company has a float of, let's say, a million shares, and it trades on 30 million shares of volume today, it's trading 30 times the entire float. That means we have a float rotation of 30. And essentially, anyone who wanted to sell the stock had ample opportunity to sell. And if it hasn't dropped and it's still going higher, that's when we can get a, a really big move. Now, when you have a stock that has a 300 million share float and it has 10 million shares of volume or even 30 million shares of volume, and it's up 20, 30, 40, 50%, you still have 270 million shares of of holders out there who are up 40, 50%, what are they gonna start doing when the stock is up? They're gonna start selling. So in order for a 300 million share float stock to go up 30, 40, 50%, it's typically gonna need 800, 900 million shares of volume in one day. That doesn't happen very often at all. So you have to ask yourself when you're looking at a chart, does this have the potential to make a big move? Now, this stock just hit my scanners a moment ago, REBN. REBN is the ticker. It's priced at, well, right now, $2.48. It's got about half a million shares of volume, 560,000 shares. And the float displayed in this column right here is 773,000 shares. So that's a very small float. Let's see how much the stock is up. It's up 85%. It's up 85% on 500,000 shares of volume. Well, it only has a float of 700,000 shares. So it's not going to take a huge amount of demand to create that imbalance, given the supply side of the equation is already so low. Now, if we compare that to a company like, just as for example, Ford Motor Company. With Ford Motor Company, we would joke that this is this chart looks like a barcode because it's it's basically sideways. These blips going up and down are mostly high frequency trading algorithms and investors long term that are moving in and out of positions. And and look, this at the close had six million shares of volume. So you could literally move sixty million dollars, seventy million dollars, you know, a hundred million dollars in or out of this stock very easily. You could buy $10 million worth of stock and not be up or down more than a couple thousand dollars because the stock doesn't move. Now that makes that stock very attractive to long-term investors, you know, pension funds, mutual funds. They're trying to mitigate their risk. But as active traders, what are we? We are hunters of volatility. 
We want volatility. We don't want to trade something that's a barcode. We want to trade something that has the potential to go up, not just three, four, five percent in a day, but 30, 40, 50 percent, 100 percent in one day. That's what we get excited about. Now, if we look at this stock scanner right here, this is a um, continuation scanner. And what do you notice about the float of these stocks on a continuation scanner? All of them are quite low. In fact, most of them are less than 10 million shares. And this is sorted by the stocks that have made the biggest that have had the biggest percentage range in the last two weeks. So some of these have huge ranges, like insanely big. And the ones that have the biggest ranges tend to have lower floats. So if you said to me, hey Ross, take a look at Ford Motor Company. Um, you know, you know, stock stock ticker F. I think that this is a maybe an interesting daily chart. I don't know. Maybe you say, oh, look, it's holding over the 200 moving average. Uh, maybe we could buy like first candle to make a new high and get a move back up to 13. I would say, are you out of your mind? <laughs> are you out of your dang mind? This stock is not going anywhere. This is not something you want to day trade. But I can't tell you how many times I've had to say that to a beginner trader. They'll say, hey, Ross, you know, look at this stock. And sometimes it's people who are looking at maybe the meme stocks like AMC or, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond or whatever. And I get how these have gained a lot of um, attention because, you know, social media and everything else. But I but I see it also just on, you know, sort of ordinary stocks, um, you know, Apple, Facebook, sometimes tech stocks, household name stocks, but also sometimes just obscure stocks that I look at and I'm thinking, guys, this float is way too high. Let's see, we've got NWTN today was gapping up 31%. Uh, so, you know, if we look at this one, it does have pretty high volume today. But with this float, I just wouldn't expect to see clean price action. And as it turns out, the price action really isn't that great on it today. You know, did it move a little bit? Yeah, but nobody really cares about it. People aren't going to get excited about it. What people get excited about, this is human psychology. They get excited about stocks that are up. And this is what's kind of crazy is that once a stock is up 50%, it has such a higher likelihood of going up another 50% than a stock that's up zero does to going up 50%. So like once you've made that, it's going up your first 50% is always the hardest. And then once you're there, it's like, next thing you know, it's up 100%, 150%, 200%. Because once it's up 50%, what does that stock have going for it? Now it's on the top of top gainer lists all around the world for people that are trading the US market. So now millions of eyes are on this stock. It's trending on social media. Even some media, uh, you know, traditional media will have coverage of some of the top gainers. They might mention it on, you know, a TV show or something like that. Oh yeah, the stock is up, you know, 100%. So once a stock starts to get that attention, now people feel like I don't want to miss a piece of this action. And once it's up high, even though it maybe doesn't make sense to buy it, people want it that much more and it keeps going higher. We saw the same thing happen on NVIDIA uh, and Tesla and, and many of these other large cap stocks, but it happens uh, on the lower price stocks to an even greater extent and it happens even faster. So you've got to know what you're looking at. And the first thing obviously is yeah, I check the daily chart. I look for the possible gaps and windows. I respect shadow theory. I check the position of the 200 moving average, of course, and I check the float. I ask myself, does this stock have a float that is worth trading or is based on the float alone? Um, am I able just to disregard the stock? In the morning, to walk you through my morning routine, I pull up these scans on my phone. So I'm looking at the top gapper, uh, top gainer scan on my phone. And if I see a stock, for instance, like SE, LX. I'll look at this and I'll be like, ah, eh, 33 million share float, price at $1.44. I can tell you with a pretty high degree of certainty that this is a stock that it doesn't have enough volume. The float's too high. It's too cheap. It's just, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for the stock. I won't even bother looking at the chart. I know from the technicals right there, I don't need to waste my time. But when I look at the gap scanner and I see, you know, if I saw meds was the leading gapper right here with a 500,000 share float, I would be thinking, all right, this is a float that with that kind of volume, if this has a catalyst, we could see something exciting happen. This is something I should pay attention to. Now, of course, this one actually did not have a strong catalyst today, but even in spite of a strong catalyst, uh, the chart did trend higher, which is, I guess, just shows the power of this being a lower float stock. So you always want to check 
the float of the stock that you're looking at. And when I check the float on my phone and I see that it's low, then from that point, I'll pull up the chart and look deeper. But sometimes people do this in the exact opposite order. So mistake number four is when traders rely purely on daily charts. This is a huge mistake. I'm not discounting that daily chart patterns are important, but the perfect daily chart pattern will do nothing if the stock doesn't have a catalyst. And yet a stock that has a really strong catalyst, it can override negative features on the daily chart, like being under the 200. I mean, we've seen stocks that have blasted through the, the resistance at the 200 because the catalyst was so strong, traders just bought the stock even higher. So if you were gonna say, what's more important, a strong catalyst or a strong chart? Without a doubt, catalyst is number one. If a stock has a really strong catalyst, it's going to move higher. And then the chart is just going to help us gauge where we may see areas of resistance and where we can possibly find lower risk places to buy. So if you spend your time going through, you know, tons of daily charts, and I, uh, it's not necessarily bad to do this as a source of exercising your skill of just analyzing a daily chart, that's fine. Pull up daily charts, analyze them, you know, break them down, look at areas of resistance, support, the position of the moving averages. That's fine. But what you don't want to do is rely on creating a watch list just of daily charts. You start creating a watch list just of daily charts, and next thing you know, you're wasting your time because you're looking at stocks that aren't going anywhere. Yeah, the chart's interesting. Oh, you know, this might be an interesting pattern here. But the reason this went up was because of a catalyst. It had a reason to move. It's not just going up on pure random. Now, I will say that there are times that we'll have what's called a technical breakout where you'll have a chart where the stock starts to squeeze higher and maybe it's some shorts that start covering or some longs that buy just, be, just because of the technical. And then next thing you know, the stock is up 20, 30, 40%. But that really only happens when you have a super low float because then even the the lower level relatively of demand created by purely the technical breakout given low enough supply it can be enough to tip the balance of supply and demand but on a, a typical stock or the the stocks that people are usually showing me that have like 40 50 100 million share floats and they're showing me the daily chart those stocks usually don't go anywhere okay so you you want to you want to look at daily charts and you want to get really good at breaking them down and understanding the gaps the windows you know, understand how to do your due diligence on a daily chart. So there's benefit in that, but you do not want to spend your time creating, in my opinion, a watch list just based on daily charts. Because if you do that, you're really going to find you're wasting your time. Now, this is an example of a chart where, you know, the stock has been beaten up. It's below the 200 moving average. And someone might say, like I said earlier, Ross, uh, you know, this is a great stock to buy. And I'd say, you've got your 200 here. There's no catalyst. There's no reason that this stock is going to move. You know, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree with this. So chicken or the egg, what comes first? What should you focus on? You should focus on watching stocks that are moving right now and then try to figure out, analyze the daily chart. That's the best way to do it. So as an example, this uh, stock, SPEC, is hitting the scans right now. So we could look at this and we could pull up the chart and we could say, oh, you know, what's going on with this? Does it have news? Does it not have news? I don't see a news catalyst. I would see the news headline right here. So I don't see fresh news. So it looks like on very light volume after hours, it squeezed from a dollar up to 220. And then because there's no news, it came all the way back down. But you could have looked at the 200 moving average. In any case on this, you could have looked at the daily chart. You could have said, all right, well, I see we've got uh, $3.56. Now we look to the left and we look up. We're gonna draw a line right here. That's 480. Now that's probably going to be a level that's respected because it's starting to get really close to the 200 moving average, the 200 exponential moving average. So that's probably going to be our logical resistance at that spot if it made it that high. And then the next level is way up here at 804, but it would have to break through resistance here to get up there. So in this case, I would say first level 356. If we get above 356, we've got a clean window up to 480. And then we have some resistance uh, on the daily and some resistance at the 200. Before 356, um, I don't really see any of this as being super significant because this is more of that period where it's just sort of a slow, 
sell-off. So it, it does look pretty clear up towards 356. But again, what this would need is a true catalyst. If we go back to one of the other stocks that recently hit the scanner, REBN, this one, it's got the right combination of very low float, but is there a catalyst? It doesn't look like there's fresh news from today. So I don't know why this popped up after hours, but sometimes these stocks will start to pop. Traders will jump on them because they see it moving, ask questions later, they realize there's no news, and then they bail out. But if we were going to analyze the daily chart on this one, we would say, yep, you've got your 200 moving average up here at four. We look to the left and up uh, a little bit of a, you know, maybe that candle there. And then you've got a larger candle right here. So that definitely corresponds to the 200. This is a stock that's probably going to have a hard time getting over that level because you not only have your 200 moving average, you've also got the high of this candle here. So some resistance in that area. So once you get good at doing that kind of due diligence, you don't have to spend a lot of time breaking down daily charts. You just wait for a stock to hit your scanners, starting to squeeze up, and then you analyze it. I think some traders, maybe just a little bit out of boredom or because they are eager to make money, will start analyzing the charts of every stock they hear mentioned on you know, MSNBC or whatever. And next thing you know, they're pulling up Zillow and they're pulling up you know just these random charts that are not going to be good for day trading. It's a 200 million share float. You know, is it above the 200? Okay, sure. But it's just, it's not the right combination. So again, this comes back to focusing on the right stocks to trade. The right stocks to trade for most active traders, me certainly included, but for most momentum traders, you're looking for something that's volatile, you're looking for something that has an imbalance between supply and demand, you're probably looking for a stock that has some type of news catalyst. It's got to be up at least 10, 15% at a minimum. It's probably going to have high relative volume. And the stocks that you're going to get the biggest percentage returns on are going to be lower priced. It's easier for a $2 stock to go up 100% than a $20 stock to go up 100%. It's just that it's just that's the reality. So when we see these big percentage movers, you know, you can look at this uh, continuation scan. You'll also notice a similarity in price. Pretty much all of these are lower price with the with a couple of exceptions here. Now, when we look at some of these stocks that are exceptions, SWIN. SWIN. Okay, this one's an exception. What could we note about this? Is there anything unique about this chart? Something unique about this chart? You could probably see this certainly looks different from the daily chart of Ford Motor Company, for example, right? These daily charts look very different. So what's the deal with that SWIN chart? SWIN, type it correctly, is a somewhat recent IPO. Okay, so number five, the fifth mistake that most beginner traders totally miss is the fact that there are certain types of daily charts that have the potential to create explosive moves. Uh, I call them juice factors. Um, it's kind of, I don't know why where I came up with that, but like momentum having some juice, it's a, it's a multiplying effect. So when we have a stock, I'll jump on the whiteboard here, that let's just say for instance, meets our criteria is up, you know, 30%, uh, has high, uh, relative volume, let's say the relative volume is like, you know, 575, super high. Uh, the stock is priced between two and 20. So it's in that price range that active traders love. Naturally, it has news. And, you know, then on the demand side, the float is like 2 million shares. This is the type of stock that can, that can do a lot just based on this. Regardless of the position of the 200 moving average, pretty much regardless of the chart, this, is, especially if the news catalyst is strong, this is something that I would consider trading. Again, almost regardless of what the chart looks like. This is, from a technical perspective, something I'd be very interested. Now, there are some things that could make the chart totally invalid. Perhaps a stock that has a history of popping and selling off, tons of big red candles, big red projections on the daily chart. You know, perhaps a stock that's really close to its 200 moving average. But again, if the news catalyst is, is strong enough, it'll probably go. Okay, so while all of this is good, we've got a couple of different um, daily characteristics, daily chart patterns. Um, 
And, and it's not just a pattern. It's a daily, it, it, it's, it's like, it's just a characteristic, a daily characteristic that if you've got all of these and then you also have one of these, these are like your daily multipliers. This is when things get crazy. The first one is a recent IPO. So if we look at SWIN, you will notice that this is a recent IPO. I, I can't tell you the number of incredible trades I've had on recent IPOs. Why can recent IPOs be so strong? What typically happens with an IPO is the stock opens and it will sell off a little bit. It'll sell off a little bit and then it'll start to curl. This happens for a couple of reasons. Um, a, a lot of times there's a lot of hype going into the IPO and then at the IPO, some people that got shares in the IPO will sell them and take profit. So you have some profit taking, the stock drops in price. And then you start to get into this period where the company starts putting out news and investors start looking at it and reevaluating the stock. And if it starts to move higher, it has a target, like a magnet at going back to its all-time high, which in this case was the high of the IPO day right here at 1285. Now, if it can hold that level as it did right here, then above that, there is literally no resistance. So we call that a blue sky setup. All right, so a recent IPO, and I'm just going to put this down here, um, Blue Sky. I'm going to put it down here because Blue Sky can occur with other patterns. And one of the things that makes a recent IPO so strong is the fact that it is a Blue Sky setup. But if we look, for instance, um, so it, down in this area, this was not yet a Blue Sky candidate because at this point, this was just a recent IPO. It was a recent IPO that was squeezing higher and it went from $4 to six to seven. It pulled back, it came back up to seven. It goes up to eight to nine. And then at this point, it's double topping against its all time high, which can be a form of resistance. That was the all time high that can be resistance. So that's a profit target for people who bought down here, down here and down here. So then we get that rejection, it pulls back. And then off that level, it comes back up and it has the strength to break through. And now this is where things get exciting. So once we break through and we're at all time highs, there is no upside resistance. And people recognize that these stocks can go incredibly high. So they're often very careful about shorting a strong stock like this. This literally went from $12 a share to 65 bucks. And you might think that that's an insane move, but I'll show you a really insane move. This is a recent IPO. It was uh, the, the stock ticker is HKD. And we got to go back here. The stock IPOs at 14, it pretty much goes like straight up, goes up to 30. It drops down on this day, but then it closes high. And this takes the form of a candle that's called a hammer. A hammer candle is called a hammer because it's hammering out the base. The stock sold off in this candle period, but it got bought back up, which initially shows weakness, but because it got bought back up, it shows strength. It pulls back a little bit here and here, and then it goes up. And this stock goes from $20 all the way to $50 a share. Oh, maybe I should move my, my mouse here. It pulls back a little bit more. Then it goes up to 80 to 100. Oh my gosh. How high are we going to go? 100, 200. Should I keep going? 300, 400, 500, 600. How high do you think this is going to go? Up to 700, up to 1,000. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This went up to over $2,500 in one day. Look at that high. That is insane. That is crazy. So if you shorted 10,000 shares of this, you could have lost millions and millions and millions of dollars. So people are careful about shorting these types of stocks. And buyers in the market, the bulls, we like these types of stocks because we know the potential they have. All right, so that one was particularly crazy. Let's look at VANI. VANI, this one has a 27 million share float. So the float is a little bit higher. But let's look at the chart. What you're going to realize is that this had one of the multipliers on it, which helped override the fact that the float was a little higher. Yes, the float was a little higher on Vanny. It still went from a dollar to over over uh, eight dollars in one day. A solid 800% return. Let's look back at this chart. Let's try to get some context. So this chart, somewhat recent IPO. All time high was three. Once we were over three, we were in blue sky territory. All right. Now let's look at another one that's got a higher float, 18 million shares. And then again, this isn't a high float, but it's slightly higher. So let's look at this. What does this stock have going for it? This one is a recent special acquisition company. 
So you could, I know that because it was trading at $10. SPACs, special acquisition companies, are companies that are created with the sole purpose of going out and buying a privately held company, merging with it, and making that company publicly traded. So when a SPAC is created, all the investors buy in at $10 a share. And then if they sell 10 million shares at $10 a share, they raise 100 million bucks. They take that 100 million to go try to buy a company that's private and merge it. When they decide to merge, all the insiders have a chance to redeem their shares. They could say, ah, no, I don't want to merge with this company. I'm out. So they have a shareholder vote. Those who proceed, if the deal goes through, then the stock does the merge and it becomes publicly traded. In the case of um, AI, AISP, it sold off quite a bit following the merger. That's not uncommon. But now it's got all-time lows down here to $1.55. And then what does it have happen? Breaking news comes out. And look at the volume. Over 200 million shares of volume in one day. It sends it big time. It goes from like a dollar fifty up to six bucks. The next day, it's hitting nine dollars a share. Now, so I'm going to write this one down as um, recent SPAC. So recent IPO, recent SPAC have sort of a similar effect, and both of these have the potential of becoming blue sky setups. So initially, AISP wasn't exactly a blue sky setup, but it it really didn't have a lot of overhead resistance because look, it had two hundred million shares of volume on this day. That's more volume than every single one of these days put together and then times like 10. I mean, these days had no volume, 200,000 shares, 190,000 shares. So yes, there might've been some people holding from these levels, but there was more than enough volume by a lot to, to accumulate all those shares. Now, if this had had, you know, 50 million shares of volume a day, that would be a different story. And if it had a float of 500 million shares, it wouldn't have gone up this much because there would have been a lot more people who would have been selling shares into the move. And then as a result, that would sort of absorb that momentum and bring down the extent of the volatility. Again, just signifying how important that combination is between supply and demand, float, and, um, float and the number of shares of volume on any particular day. So that was AISP. Um, let's look at another one on here. Let's see, maybe QNRX. We'll probably have to look at one with a particularly low float. So we might do LYT. Let's look at LYT. So LYT, this is a stock that uh, we traded recently. Do you see this S on the daily chart? That S means the stock is a recent reverse split. Okay, so a recent reverse split means this is a stock that has been selling off for a long time. It's got a very beaten up daily chart. It's been selling off. And then in order to maintain compliance with the exchanges, the stock has to maintain a minimum price of a dollar. So the only way they could do that was by doing a stock split, a reverse stock split. And they did a 60 to one split. So if you were holding 60 shares down here at, oh gosh, the math is going to take me a second. But let's, let's just say you were holding 60 shares down here at 10 cents. The next day, you're going to log in and you're going to have um, one share, but it's going to be priced at $6 a share, right? 60 to one reverse split. So all of a sudden, the stock has jumped up times 60 in price, but the total number of shares available to trade has dropped down by a ratio of 60. That's why the float on this, hello, 100,000 shares. That's ridiculously low, ridiculously low float. This stock 200 moving average, the exponential is up around 25. The simple is around two is around $15. You know, a little bit of a window right here on the chart going to the left and up another one kind of in this area, maybe a little something right in there. So there's a couple levels that are interesting. But what made this have that multiplier effect was the fact that it was a recent reverse split. The recent reverse split had the effect of drastically reducing the float. Now the float is so low that the company comes out with news and that creates enough demand. And it doesn't take a lot in this scenario for the stock to go up, you know, 800, a thousand percent. It makes an incredible move. So I would say right now in this market, the, the juice factors or the multiplying factors are recent reverse splits, recent IPOs, uh, recent SPACs. These are the three that sort of have the most potential. And the recent IPOs and recent SPACs often go hand in hand with a blue sky setup, a stock that's at all time highs. Now, there are other 
stocks that will go up to all time highs like Tesla did or like Nvidia did and they're large cap stocks but they'll keep going higher. Now this this is powerful on these ones because they have so much momentum behind them. They just keep going higher and even when they pull back for a second, there are enough traders that just buy these dips. So when you have a stock that's at this kind of blue sky setup and it's a large cap, they actually can perform pretty well. Uh, in spite of the flow being higher. In this case, it's 2.4 billion shares, but it's a blue sky setup, all time highs. People are super hyped about it, you know, and, and that's what gives it that extra juice. And we saw the same thing, of course, with Tesla. And we've seen it with other stocks that become, uh, you know, the targets of, of a lot of attention, media coverage, and, and so on and so forth. So blue sky can work on large caps, mid caps, and small caps. Uh, recent IPOs, recent re recent SPAC mergers, those are more specific to small caps. And reverse splits are very specific to small caps. Reverse splits uh, don't happen really with large cap stocks. Traditional stock splits happen, but not reverse splits. Now, I would say another uh, another multiplying effect that's not specific to stock chart is when the stock has a catalyst that falls within what is the current theme, so to speak. So we notice themes in the market. We had a period uh, last year, and we've seen this happen several times, where Chinese stocks, stocks where the company is located in China, became like all the rage. HKD was a Chinese stock, the one that went from $20 to 2500 a share. And then there were like 15 other Chinese stocks that made moves, not as big as that, but that were also pretty big. And so we got into this habit of when we looked at a chart, we were also asking ourselves, not just sort of our standard due diligence of, you know, shadow theory, position of the 200 moving average, you know, flow, gaps, windows, everything else. We were also saying, well, you know, is this a Chinese stock? So right now, very recently, biotechs have been super hot and especially biotechs and pharmaceutical companies with uh, weight loss drugs. Ozampic has been such a big thing that a lot of these small cap companies that are doing clinical trials that have good results from anything that's related to weight loss is like, you know, people are getting super excited about that. Hey, if I could lose weight without having to diet and I can still eat whatever I want, you know, people are excited about that. So that's a catalyst that's working really well right now. It's a theme, but the theme will shift. Eventually what will happen is companies will start putting out headlines to try to capitalize on momentum in a theme. It's a little, you know, it's a little shady. And these companies will try to, you know, get their stock price to go up a little higher by throwing in some of these keywords, and then that'll kind of stop working. And the theme will sort of end. And then we'll go into a new phase where we have a new theme. And maybe it'll be something related to like something that's happening in the world. It could be, you know, something related to COVID or something related to security or, uh, you know, by, like internet security. It's, it's the theme shifts. But asking yourself... Um, what is the theme right now? And again, it's not exactly a chart. It's more of a characteristic. Uh, but what's the theme right now? And does this news catalyst fall within the theme? So actually, one of my biggest trades of the year was on a stock that hit my scanner. It was up like 30%, had high relative volume. The price was right. The float was fine. Had a great daily chart, no issue. And then I saw the news was related to weight loss. And I was like, okay, boom. I'm going to, because I know the power of that catalyst with the current theme, I'm going to take bigger position than normal. And of course, because the catalyst was strong and this is the theme, the stock did go higher than a typical stock might have if it had not uh, similar characteristics, but a different news headline. And it became my biggest winner of the year. Reading stock charts alone is not a strategy. It's a component of a strategy. So if you want a PDF of my small account strategy, I will put a link in the description. You can download it. You can use it. You can practice it. I'm happy to share it with you. So I'll pin it to the top of the description. I'll pin it to the top of the comments and you download that PDF. That's going to combine technical analysis with actual strategy. Strategy is the rules of these are the types of stocks I trade. This is where I get in. This is where I get out. This is the time of day I trade. It's your business plan of how you're going to attack the market. Traders who are successful are systematic in the way they enforce their rules, the way they approach trading. It can't be haphazard. It can't be shooting from the hip and willy nilly taking a couple trades from your phone while you're at a stoplight. If you want to be a successful trader, 
You've got to be dedicated. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to be driven and you've got to bring your A game. You've got to take it seriously. So make sure you download my small account strategy PDF. I think you'll really enjoy it. And hey, if you watched up until now, do me a favor, hit that thumbs up. And I hope you subscribe to the channel for more episodes on day trading strategy, just like this. Thanks as always for tuning in. And I'll see you for the next upload real soon.